Last week, I had this epic run in a handful of positions. This is for my personal account. And I mean, like double digit percentage wise gains closer to triple digits. And then I screwed it up. And I screwed it up because I got emotional. I got, um, oh, this is going to continue. This is going to continue. And instead of following my process, I got emotional. And guess what happened? In this video, I'm going to talk about building a process, my process, and at the end, give you a handful of ideas, sector ideas, to apply a process to. Who hasn't gotten emotional about investing or putting money to work with a, uh, a stock or a bond or currency or whatever? Who hasn't done that? And who hasn't paid the price for that emotion? That, oh, this is just gonna continue on. I mean, I got buddies who got wiped out because of the financial crisis back in 07, 09. I got buddies who got wiped out of their housing business, their developer business back during the same period of time. And the same thing during the dot-com situation. I mean, it's happened throughout history. You get emotional, you think it's never gonna end, and guess what? You get taken to the cleaners. Well, that's what happened to me on a handful of positions. Now, do I think they'll recover? Yeah, I hope so. It would be great. But I got emotional and I, have built a process over the last 20 some years through trial and error and through learning from my mistakes and learning from my wins that you have to have a process that eliminates the emotional side. And so here's my process. First off, you've got to see what the weather is going to be like and what the weather is gonna be like in the season that you're in. What do I mean by that? Well, like everything, we human beings, the earth, markets, all move in cycles. We have winter, spring, summer, and fall. We know that we need to dress accordingly depending on where we live based on the season before we go outside and make a pay a price. I mean, when I see my kids walk out the door in the middle of winter, okay, in shorts and a t-shirt, I know they don't have a process of deciphering, what do I wear? Well, it's the same thing with investing. You have to have a process. And I've come to this conclusion that math tells me how to better invest. It takes the emotional side out of everything. I mean, math is pretty darn straightforward. One plus one is two. Two plus two is four, and so on. You, you just can't argue with it. And when the math is correct and done correct, it gives you a definitive answer. Well, that's how I look at markets. That's how I look at economic cycles. It's based on math. Rate of change, and I, I, it isn't like I came up with this on my own. I've learned this because of people who have built systems and applied those systems and are so kind to share those systems with us in the public and being able to take pieces and parts and putting it together and building my own process and system. And in doing so, and when I stick to my process and system, I have great success. I have a month like I had last month holy cow month. A, if I keep this up, I'll pay off the national debt month kind of situation. But when the emotional side comes in and that, oh, this will just continue to keep going, that's when it all blows up. And so I start with a global macro. Where are we in the cycle? At what phase in the cycle are we? From there, I break it down into what performs best in that cycle. So for instance, right now, what's happening? Well, we've come out of a recession and we have liquidity that's been injected into the system and that money is being spent and it's 
not at the rate maybe in the past in prior economic recoveries, but it's being spent. And we're seeing economic growth year over year, not day over day or week over week or month over month, but year over year, we're seeing growth. And so here in the United States, we're projected to have 11% growth over last year. Now take into account, last March, everything went to hell in a handbasket, right? So we are recovering off that low. So we are anticipating that we should see a continued growth. We're seeing continued growth from second quarter to third quarter. And now we're in that phase of a new presidency, new economic policies, and we're seeing money put out into the system through stimulus. And now that money is being deployed via buying stuff or investing into the market as we saw back in second quarter. And now things are growing again. So I take that and I go, okay, we're in a growth situation. We're also seeing inflation. We're seeing inflating prices. We're seeing the cost of goods going up. Go down to your local lumber store like I did uh, over the weekend and I bought uh, 40 two by 10s by 12s, two inch, 10 inch by 12 feet length boards. Now, a year ago, those were probably 15 bucks, okay? Today, they're $22, and that's cheap depending where you live. So lumber costs have inflated. The cost of those goods have inflated. So we're seeing inflation. We're seeing inflating prices. We're seeing growth going up, inflation. And guess what? Our monetary policy, our government is keeping money super cheap. So it's very hawkish, okay? This is a, com a combination for economic growth. The last time we saw this was when President Trump was elected in 2016. We saw s growth, economic growth. We saw inflation, inflating, infl I don't want to say inflating, okay? And things inflated in price. And we saw a hawkish monetary policy. Now, what do we buy in an environment like that? Let's talk a little bit about the U.S. dollar. When the U.S. dollar goes up in value, things like commodities have an opposite correlation. You got to look at things from in relation to the U.S. dollar and how they correlate to other things. Okay, so for instance, um, a certain cryptocurrency has an opposite correlation to the U.S. dollar. Commodities have an opposite correlation to the U.S. dollar. Tech has an opposite correlation to the U.S. dollar, along with other parts of the world. So like countries and um, areas like developed countries versus emerging countries, they have an opposite correlation. So once you've determined where you are in the macro, global macro environment, and if like we are in now, where we're accelerating growth, accelerating inflation, and we're seeing a, a hawkish mentality from our leaders in Washington, keeping money cheap, and they're just fueling this growth, then what is, what is happening to the U.S. dollar? Well, the U.S. dollar is devaluing. And so if you go back a year or back into March, the dollar spiked because there was a liquidity crisis. The one thing we are not having yet is a liquidity crisis. What happened last week with Robinhood and uh, GameStop and AMC theaters and the Wall Street bet guys was a temporary blip of liquidity crisis in a very particular place, Robin Hood and the raid on basically these hedge funds who are heavily leveraged, okay? It's a minor blip. It's working itself out. Um, who knows if the plumbing is still solid? We'll find out in a book a year from now. But what is happening is there's a lot of liquidity. So if there's a lot of liquidity, markets are going to continue to go higher. So if the dollar devalues and we're imprinting more money and the dollar devalues, well, then that means we have an opposite correlating situation. So what does well there? Well, 
like I said, commodities do well. What in commodities do, what is a commodity? Well, commodity is lumber, a commodity is oil and gas, uh, or, uh, corn and copper. Those are commodities. Those are things I can, you know, I got, you know, heck, my jacket is nylon. It's a commodity, okay? So as the dollar devalues, commodities go up. So those are an area that I want to be invested in. I want to have money deployed there as the dollar continues to devalue. Now let's just check ourselves real quick. The dollar moves like in a penny or two penny ranges, okay? But it's significant enough of a range that you go, oh yeah, that can have this kind of effect on this kind of asset class and vice versa. And so when you understand the movement of the dollar, then all of a sudden you understand, oh, if that is oppositely correlated to the dollar and the dollar goes up, it's gonna go down, right. And when it's at a top end of its range, and this is where your math comes into play. And I use very, I'm still building it, and I will always build it because I am curious and I want to better my system. So I use a look back at 15 moving, 15 day or 15 period moving average. And then I look at the standard deviation of that and I figure out what the range is in that 15 day period. Now, I have been luckily taught by some incredible people at Hedgeye who have explained that Mar the quantitative funds out there run on 30 day periods of time. And so by taking it down to 15, you in a sense, in a sense, front run their decisions because they're computer algorithms. They're not human beings who are like, hmm, that may not be right. And so they're not changing them that way. So by looking at more of a 15 day period versus a 30 day period, we can get a jump on a situation. Now, Full on credit to Keith and his guys there, guys and gals there at Hedgeye. I would encourage you to check out their website. They have brought the world of uh, fractal math and uh, macro uh, investing down to a level you can understand. And this is where I've learned a lot along with Giving, they gave me a jumping jump start, and now I've gone out to seek more because I do have questions, and I'm a curious person, so I go and investigate this. That said, the dollar correlation, and I was taught by this by Keith and Hedgeye guys, is that it is a big mover in how things work. When I'm deciding, once I understand where I'm at in the growth or recessionary, stagflationary phase, I then buy assets that will do well. So like I was saying, uh, commodities. So I have exposure to commodities. Um, I'm looking for good companies who are going to capitalize on a growing global e economy. Uh, then I look for another's and so like technology. So I'm looking at technology from the standpoint of what happened in March of 2020 has changed a lot of things. I still have friends who have kids who have yet to go back to school and they're still doing school online. So what technology is fueling them? What companies are leading that charge to that change, that shift in our, how we do things on a day-to-day uh, a -day, uh, global scale? Those are the technology companies I'm looking for. Look, think about the vaccine. I mean, vaccines typically take three to five years in, uh, of trials before they're actually put out into the market, we had something cranked out in less than a year. Now, as one of my doctor said to me, when you eliminate red tape and you inject an enormous amount of capital, things get done fast. And with the information data that we are gaining about the human genome, and we're able to run that through data calculation models via computer and technology, we're coming up with solutions to our health problems. And there was a great, ep a great uh, segment on 60 Minutes this uh, past week about how some countries and some companies are really going after mining our data, our DNA data, and how infringing on our policy, privacy is. Now, if you got cancer and somebody can give you a pill and it solves your cancer problem, you're gonna take it, right? 
Yet, there's the other side of it where they get too far into controlling us. Anyways, I, 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 I digress. I apologize. Anyhow, so commodities, tech. I'm looking for those areas. Now, let's talk about countries. What develop, develop versus emerging markets, what countries are going to capitalize on a devaluing dollar, a growing economic uh, global environment? And what you'll find is emerging markets. Now, I'm not just talking China. I mean, that's the typical one you go. But look at, you know, the countries like China, um, uh, Thailand, Russia, uh, Norway, uh, India. I mean, these are countries that as technology becomes cheaper and cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, and it's easier for them to, uh, to implement uh, different technologies that at one time were way out of their financial reach, you're going to see emerging markets explode. And so like 5G, instead of putting up a 3G tower, you just go straight to the 5G because it's cheaper than it cost the th people to put up a 3G tower. So they're integrating technology into their countries and they're doing more and more and more. I mean, 3D printing is a prime example of a technology that really eliminates a lot of uh, the mass of, um, of manufacturing. And these other countries that can apply those technologies will capitalize on that and be able to sell those goods throughout the world. And as long as the dollar continues to devalue and the ability to keep technology on the cheap, then you're going to see emerging markets growing. And I would challenge you to look at these countries in a different way. You know, I did a video here recently about um, how payment system in shopping and how with like Australia, they're pretty much locked down still. Um, so going out to the store or the mall and shopping is, is not really feasible. So now you're going online. And so there's a lot of different ways people can shop now. It's not just, you know, the Amazons of the world. There are many others that are sprouting up. But more importantly is how financially the, um, uh, the financial payment process is evolving. And what we're seeing is more of a um, online payment system. The, and actually the challenging of your typical Visas, MasterCards, American Expresses out there uh, systems where it's, you know, hey, I go to this online mall, I'm able to shop at, like a mall, all these different stores, and I pull a, a product from each uh, different store, I put it into a basket, now I pay through it through one uh, basket trans a transaction, and I have the choice of spreading those payments out over a period of time. I can pay cash or pay for them all up 100% percent up front now, or I can spread them out over, you know, a month, uh, three months, six months, whatever period of time. And what that does is it's challenging the credit card system. So these countries that uh, didn't have the ability to sell their goods, I mean, think about a lot of emerging market countries, they're not at the financial level we are in the United States. So they don't have the infrastructure, but as this infrastructure becomes cheaper and is deployed and internet is available, and the fact that you can get on a cell phone and do a whole lot, take a picture of a product you just manufactured, put it on your website, which you just developed through uh, uh, an app on your, on your phone, deploy it, and then have a shipping system that you can send that product from Thailand to uh, England, for, who, you know, from a purchase, person who purchased it in England from that person in Thailand, all of a sudden you increase the possibilities of e-commerce. And as the dollar devalues, emerging markets will continue to do well over the long term. So let's talk about speculation. There's been an enormous amount of talk about that here recently. We've seen that play out over the month of January and uh, groups of people who have amassed um, uh, millions of people to go after one company or a mo different types of companies who have been put on the ropes uh, prior to them uh, uh, being discovered by these um, groups like uh, Wall Street Bets, um, you're seeing momentum. And that is a oftentimes when you see momentum plays, understand momentum ends. You know, uh, if your car is going 100 miles an hour and there's a brick wall there, it abruptly ends, right? Um, so you have to be aware of that. So there are a lot of 
um, plays out there that people are speculating on. I, I caution you though, as quickly as, this, as the momentum is you know, going at a super rate, it can abruptly change. And this is where my process of getting, uh, that I ignored my process last week, my emotions got in the way. And because I didn't have, uh, implement my process and follow my process, my emotions took me out. I mean, I, heck of a, I would have started, you know, February 1st on a really high note. Um, had a great month, but still had, it would have been better as we go into the beginnings of this month. Momentum companies are definitely out there, but you got to have a process and you have to have intentions of what am I doing here? If I buy it here, where am I getting out? I mean, we are all pretty much incredible buyers, but we're, more importantly, we're horrible sellers. And that's where having a process to determine when you get in and get out is really key. I, uh, I saw a post where this guy, um, was it a DV, D, oh, excuse me, deep F value. Um, don't, sorry if I, I don't want to offend anybody, but that's his tag name. Um, at one point I think it was up $35 million on the GameStop position. And then all of a sudden today I see GameStop is now, it's gotten as low as $76 today. How much did he mine his gains? Did he have a process of capitalizing on that gain, he had a process of making those gains, but did he have a process of mining the gains? Did he take money off the table? Did he prevent losing all of that money? I don't know. It'll come out at some point. Uh, but it is one of those things that when you're investing via a momentum style, you have to have the discipline and the process to know when to say when. This is enough, it has met my goal, here you go. So I was talking to a buddy of mine and he was talking about certain positions and he said that, uh, he's like, well, when do we get out? And I said, well, let's relate it to something that's important to you, like how much is your weekly income needs? How much uh, does it cost to put groceries on the table or food on the table every week? Maybe you set it up in that way in that once you've achieved that goal, uh, of, of being able to cover the groceries for a week, a month, whatever, you take that money off the table and you put it aside and you play with your principal, val your principal amount. And he liked that idea. He's like, oh, that, well, that makes sense. Now I have a tangible item that I can attach that to. So having a process of when to get in, that's been easy for a lot of people. It's when to get out. So attach it to something you can relate it to that you say, you know what, if I'm up X so much percent, that's good with me. I have a buddy who is in real estate and he told me all I want to do is make $25,000 per property I buy and I do about 50 properties a year. 50 properties times 25,000 minimum. Now, if he that's the minimum he wants to make. So let's say his average is just, let's just say he just makes 25,000 times 50 properties a year. Holy cow, that's a heck of a living, wouldn't you agree? So that is the kind of process I believe we should all have when it comes to investing. And that's when your positions go from, you know, I have an initial equity position of 6% max when I put in, and as it grows, I see how my portfolio looks, and if it gets out of whack, then I reduce it back down to the original amount. I don't want to get blown up. I don't want to be that potentially that person who killed it over the last month, all of a sudden it has lost a, you know, half or three fourths of what he had. Just don't be that way. So in conclusion, it's a process. Please build a process. Simply look at the global macro. Where are we? What season is it economically? Then break down what performs well in that season. And then look for the companies that are good, solid companies that have the potential of dominating in that area during that season and you invest. And then know when to say when. When you've made your goal, pull the trigger and be done and be happy. Of course, you're gonna have positions that go higher beyond where you took it out. Don't have regret because it doesn't care about you, so why you care about the difference, don't. 
just have a solid process.